We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts into his presence. We bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts into his presence. We bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. Good morning, Berea. What a beautiful weekend we've had thus far. We've got a little rain going on. We had a great turnout at Trunk or Treat last night. We had a lot of uh, uh, goblins and and goons, mostly uh, goblins, I think. Uh, Had great food, hamburgers and hot dogs and chili and enjoyed by all. We had a large turnout, so we're blessed that that event went off. We had great weather, had a hayride afterwards. Nobody got hurt. Amen. Amen. Um, we have some announcements uh, in addition to what's in our family news here, so if you'll bear with me. I um, got a note this morning from uh, Tara and Lucas Boone. We wanted to thank everyone who contributed to our wedding shower card basket. All the cards were greatly appreciated. Love, Tara and Lucas. So uh, we'll hang this up on the, in the foyer on the, uh, on the board back there. We uh, have another celebration. A birth to Andy and Gail Robinson as their first grandchild gets into the world early Saturday morning, about 1230. Hank Charles Knott was born to Holly and Chase Knott. Came in uh, at 8 pounds, 9 ounces, and 20 inches. So Hank is on the floor. Uh, It is food pantry stocking time. So uh, if if, uh, you can get us some peanut butter and some grape jelly, that's the emphasis right now. So we need peanut butter and grape jelly to stock the food pantry. We'll be gathering baskets, getting that out to the community. So uh, make a note of that, peanut butter and jelly. I had another announcement uh, handed to me this morning. Uh, Betty Burroughs, the the mother of Jeff and Tim Burroughs, is having hip surgery this morning. So keep Miss Betty in in our prayers. Uh, Many of you uh, may know Betty from her days at Friendship in the Cafeteria. Inside our bulletin today is our November list of those who are serving, those men who are serving. So uh, take a note of that, look at that over, make a note on your calendar so you'll be prepared to serve the Lord. Okay, we'll continue on and uh, go Vols. Our next song with this morning will be That's Why We Praise Him. It's a, it's a little newer song, but it's a great song as we focus our minds on worship and continue in praise to our Lord. So if you know it, sing out. And if you don't, hopefully we can all learn together. So if you will, please stand as we sing, as we sing That's Why We Praise Him. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word, our light. He came to die, so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise, to show His power and might. That's why we praise Him, that's why we sing. That's why we offer Him our everything. 
That's why we bow down and worship this king, because he gave his everything. Because he gave his everything. He came to live, live again in us. He came to be our conquering king and friend. He came to heal and show the lost ones his love. He came to go, prepare a place for us. That's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Because he gave his everything. Halle, hallelujah. Halle, hallelujah. Halle, hallelujah. Halle, hallelujah. And that's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Because he gave his everything. Because he gave his everything. Amen. You can be seated. The song before Jason Denton leads us in scripture and Stan Watson leads our opening prayer will be the love of God. <clears throat> Since the love of God has shed priceless blessings on my head, I have made it my own. I will hide it in my heart that it never may depart. It shall rule there alone. The love of God within the heart will kindliness and warmth impart. The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy. If the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God glows like a flame. Through endless years it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see him face to face. Since the Son of God came down with his love, our hearts to crown, he with us would remain. Greater love there could not be, Jesus died for you and me in our heart. He would reign the love of God within the heart. Will kindliness and warmth impart. The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy. If the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God glows like a flame. Through endless years it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see him face to face. While his love burns true and bright, we are walking in the light. He has shown us the road. We his glory must reflect, lest our dimness and neglect keep some soul from its God. The love of God within the heart will kindliness and warmth impart. The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy. 
If the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God glows like a flame. Through endless years it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see him face to face. I'll be reading Acts chapter 8, verses 35 through 38, and I'm in the NIV version, so it's a little bit different than what's on the screen. Then Philip began with his, this very passage of the scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave the orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. How simple is that? God's plan. Pray with me. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessings that you bestow upon us, for the opportunity we have to meet freely here and worship you, for the country that we live in that gives us this opportunity. We ask you to be with the church here at Berea that as we study your word, as we break the bread of life, that we apply it to our lives and that we are the Christians that you would have us to be, and that we shall have no opportunity to spread the good news, dear Lord. And we have those among us that are sick, those who have lost loved ones, and we humbly ask you to pour your blessings out on them, dear Lord, this morning, that comfort them as only you can. Use us as you will in that knowledge. Be with the doctors that minister to the sick. Bring them back to their next most wanted walks of life, dear Lord. And dear Lord, as, as times seem to be crazy in the world, be with us that we hold on to the truth that you give us, that the only thing we can count on would be you and your son, Jesus. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, and the sacrifice that was made for us and the grace that we have through that sacrifice, dear Lord. And it says his name, we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. Our next song this morning will be Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. <clears throat> Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, Tune my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the 
God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Before Kevin comes and brings our lesson on the saving power, saving blood of Jesus Christ and how we come into contact that, we are going to sing Mighty to Save. So if you please would stand as we praise our Lord and Savior. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. Yes, He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let Let the the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. You may be seated, and our invitation song will be, There is Power in the Blood. Good morning. Great to see everybody today. John is right. We had a great crowd here last night. We filled up the fellowship hall and had a little overflow out in the parking lot. And I appreciate everyone that works so hard. Carol and Tim were help, great help in organizing it and make sure all our food was here. And uh, everybody that worked so hard to decorate their trunks and their tailgates. And it was just it was awesome, and it, I know it took a lot of work. We had our, our, our area farmers were represented by the James family and their John Deere tractors, and we had a big old hay ride out and all around, and that was wonderful. It was just good old simple, fun fellowship, and I, I told Tim while we were cooking, you know, there's nothing better than to see and to hear children having a big time. They're the laugh of a kid. When they get tickled down in their belly, I'm telling you, it is something else. And we had lots of happy children yesterday, and I think adults had a big time too. And uh, appreciate everybody that brought food. The chili was awesome. Uh, we just had a big time last night. If you missed it, we'll give you a rain check for next year. But uh, we, we certainly had a wonderful time. So thankful 
to everybody that works so hard to make it possible to, for that event. I know we had lots of folks visiting with us, and we pray that uh, that that contact, that opportunity to meet them, will lead to them to have uh, greater associations with us and for people to come to worship. And if they need Jesus, we hope to find Jesus through our association together. Our food pantry giveaway is coming up. We are going to make it on uh, November the 13th, which is going to be a Sunday afternoon instead of a Saturday. But we, as John mentioned, we want you to go ahead and start bringing in things. We are going to make a compact basket this year. Every family will get a food voucher to Owl's Food Land that will allow them to get meat and cheese and eggs and milk and perishables, things like that. But we also want to provide for them uh, foods that uh, anybody can eat. We, we have found out that we need to provide food that children can fix because a lot of them's mommies and daddies aren't fixing food. They got to be able to fix something. So peanut butter and jelly is a staple. In fact, I had uh, peanut butter and jelly yesterday for lunch. I love a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But that's good protein and good nourishment. So go ahead and start bringing in peanut butter and jellies. We're going to put them in the fellowship hall. We'll have some areas over on the side. We're going to go ahead and start bringing those in. Then we're going to need to bring in some snack bars, some applesauce in individual containers that can peel off and eat right out of the container, not the big jars. Uh, but we'll, we'll have an extensive list for you. But we just wanted you to know to go ahead and start bringing in peanut butter and jelly. We're going to get stocked up on that. And also, if you would like to contribute uh, to the food vouchers for the families, you can write a check to the church and put in the memo, food pantry giveaway, and then uh, uh, we'll know how to, to uh, move that over to that special offering for them. It is a powerful thing. We talked about that in our elders and ministers meeting this morning. It's a powerful thing when God's people get busy helping those in need. It's, it's a God business. It's what Jesus did, and it's what, if you're God's people, that's what we need to be doing. And we are so grateful that God has blessed us to enable us to help other people. And it's a blessing. It's a blessing to go to somebody and say, we care about you, we love you in the name of the Lord, and here's something to help you all out. And we pray that it will also lead them to having a relationship with us and to... Uh, have a relationship with Jesus through that as well. I don't think this one's on. Dustin? Yeah, it's on. All right, it's time for our lesson this morning. I want to um, give you a little insight into the mind of a preacher about a couple things. I want you to know that I truly believe with all of my heart that my main responsibility in preaching the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is to prepare people for the life to come and to assist people in the transition from this life to the next. I have that responsibility in a lot of different ways and I want to share with you something that you all need to think about. I've had to be dealing with this in my family. I've had to deal with this with um, people here at Berea. I've, I've had to deal with it in ministries at other churches in the past. But I need you to think about it. The first one is this. Our final wishes. Your family members need to know your final wishes. They need to know where you want to be buried. They need to know arrangements with what funeral home, whether you want to be cremated, whether you want a casket, what kind of casket, who you want to be pallbearers, who you want to speak at your funeral, all of that needs to be taken care of in advance so that people know. Because I've, I've come upon some situations where they didn't let those wishes know and it created a difficult time that was even more difficult. So I want to share that with you. If you haven't done that, you need to do that. And really, it doesn't matter your age. You need to do that and let people know where you want to be buried and all those sorts of things in preparation for the fact that, folks, we're all just visitors here. We're all just passing through. And unless we happen to be alive when the Lord comes again, we have to be prepared for the day that we leave this world. Which brings us to another 
thing that's on my heart as a minister. My job is to make sure that you are spiritually prepared for the next life to come. And I take that task, that task very, very to my heart. It's, it's, there's nothing any more important. I don't want you to stand at the judgment seat of Christ one day and to have arrived there in ignorance not realizing I should have done this or I should have done that or I should have responded to this or responded to that. I, I want to make sure that you have all the information you need from God's Word to be ready when the Lord comes again or when you depart this life. And so, one of the things that people recently have asked me about is baptism. I recently had somebody ask me if it was a requirement, do I need to be baptized uh, in order to be saved? And then I've had people recently ask me if they needed to be baptized again, that they were uh, concerned maybe they hadn't been baptized right. And so... Today and next week, Lord willing, we just want to talk about biblical baptism. Those are great questions that were asked, and they're questions that need biblical answers. I want to share to, with you this morning this. My opinion does not matter. You cannot go to the judgment scene of Christ one day and say, Kevin said, that will not matter. What will matter is the Word of God. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John chapter 12 and verse 48. So human opinion doesn't matter. You can vote on it. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that what we practice and what we teach and what we do is obedience to the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And that's what you need to stake your eternal destiny on. What the good book says, not what a human being says. Not what your family members think. Not what your traditions have been. And I want to go ahead and cut the chase and tell you this. I'm not here to make a church of Christer out of you. We have denominationalized the church. I don't want Baptist and Church of Christ and Pentecostal and Episcopalian and all manner of different fellowships I'm here to tell you today that Christ died for the church and that when we become Christians, He adds us to the church. Let's just be New Testament Christians that obey the gospel and then the Lord will add us to His church. Let's all be one. Let's not build walls that divide us. Let's not take on names He never intended. Let's just be the body of Christ. That is in my heart. And I want to go ahead and tell you this. Not everybody that got baptized in the Church of Christ church building is going to be saved. Not everybody that gets baptized in anybody else is going to be saved. But whoever does the will of God, whoever obeys the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so what I want to share with you today is just basic Bible doctrine. And I have to tell you, honestly, we have dropped the ball in our society today of basic Bible doctrine. It is amazing to me how many people do not know the Word of God. How many people are totally ignorant of what the Bible says. And how many people are preachers, have got up their own church, have got their own network, have got their own radio show or TV show. And when you hear them talk, you know they don't know Bible. I'm not here to create my own following. I'm not here to have my own church. I'm here to preach the unadulterated, simple Word of God and let God's Word, which is powerful and more sharper than any two-edged sword dividing asunder unto the joint and marrow, I want God's Word to impact us the way God intended it for. So we're going to talk about biblical baptism. That's what I was asked about. That's something that we need to preach about. But it is something that there are so many different views about. There are so many different ways it's practiced. And I want to make sure that I have and that you submit ourselves to baptism as God ordained it and as God wishes. Nothing more, nothing less. Let's just obey God and make sure. And the only way we can do that is with His Word. It is the only way. And if we add to or take from it, 
if we have changed it from what the Bible says, then we're on thin ice. I'm not the judge. I just know that God gave us his word so that we could know his will and do it. And if you or I do things that are contrary to it, or if we change things from what it says in the word, then we don't know how God thinks about that. And what a terrible way to find out is on the day of judgment. So let's talk about what does the Bible say about baptism? Well, first of all, when somebody says the word baptism, they automatically have different images in their mind of what that is and what it looks like. So here's an example. This is a baptismal service at a particular church that meets into a school. Someone has taken a small amount of water and is making the form of a cross on this lady's forehead, and he's saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. She thinks she's being baptized. This person is being baptized by a fusion. He has a small saucer-like device that's made kind of like a shell, a seashell, and he's scooping up a little water, and he's pouring it over the top of her head right in here. She thinks that she's being baptized. This is a baby that's having water sprinkled upon her head. Their family thinks that she is being baptized. This is a young boy that has walked down into a baptistry, but he has a pitcher of water that is being poured totally over the top of his body, and he thinks that he is participating in baptism. Then we have this picture where someone is being dumped. They're immersed. They're put all the way underwater, and they think that they are participating in baptism. So when you look back over this, that's to some people is a baptism. To others, that's what it looks like. To some, that, this, and that. Are all acceptable to God? Does it matter to God how you get baptized? Why you get baptized? And what's said when you're baptized? Great questions. And these are questions that we're going to answer in the next two days. Now, by the way, I had to block that one out because there's things that we didn't want to show there. But <clears throat> this is an Orthodox, a Greek Orthodox baptism. They believe that you need to be baptized by immersion, but they baptize infants as well. They blow in the face of the baby and they baptize them three times. Once in the name of the Father, once in the name of the Son, once in the name of the Holy Spirit. And that baby is being immersed in this big, um, really it's bigger than a bowl. It's a font. It's very deep. And that's what happens with that baby. Wikipedia has this to say. I'm not a fan of Wikipedia, but I want you to know a lot of people turn to Wikipedia to find answers to things. This is what Wikipedia says. What is the correct way to be baptized? That was the question that I put into Wikipedia. It says, baptism may be performed by sprinkling or pouring water on the head or by immersing in water, either partially or completely. So if you turn to a dictionary, if you turn to Wikipedia or social media, you will get this response. But what does the Bible say? The New Testament is where we're introduced to baptism. And in our New Testaments, we actually have the word baptism is a transliteration of the word baptizo. The word baptizo means to dip, to plunge, or immerse. To put it in our own language, to dunk. To put something under water. In John chapter 3 and verse 23, John the Baptist baptized at Eden near Salem because there was much water there. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 38, when Philip the evangelist goes down to this road between Gaza and Jerusalem, which is desert, he meets the Ethiopian eunuch. He's been in Jerusalem worshiping God, and he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. We know it to be the 53rd chapter. Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I unless somebody guides me? So he asks him to join him in the chariot, and verse 36 says, he began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And when they were come upon their way, they saw some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And he said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And verse 38 says, Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Philip dunked him, put him under the water. Philip immersed him. The first case 
in church history of a non-immersion baptism was something that came to be known as clinical baptism. And it happened in the 200s AD, more than 100 years after the Bible was completed. It was a man who became very, very sick, and he had never been baptized. So he requested baptism, but his doctor said that he could not withstand immersion. It would kill him. So they took him and put him on a cot and laid him outside, and they took these huge pots of water, and they poured water all over him, completely doused him. They got him as wet as you would be if you were dunked. Well, he recovered. He didn't die. And he requested to be immersed because he wasn't comfortable with that form or mode or method of baptism. But it started something. And so people began to say, well, if you can't be baptized, maybe you are an invalid, maybe you're paralyzed, maybe you have other physical conditions, then you could be clinically baptized. We'll just pour water all over you. And that began the practice. And with time, there was the question that came up, well, actually, how much water does it take? And people said, well, you really know, really, it's symbolic. The amount of water doesn't matter. Until, as you saw in some of the pictures, it has evolved through the years to where people will just pour a little bit of water from a shell on your head, or they let you stand in the baptistry and pour water on your head with one pitcher. But that that set a precedence where people began to change things and to differ things from what the Bible taught and what was practiced in Scripture. For we know that Jesus, when He gave the Great Commission, commissioned the apostles to go all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized will be saved. He wanted them to practice baptism. Jesus Himself was baptized by John in the Jordan, but His baptism is not like ours because of this one reason. Jesus was without sin. Jesus himself said to John, allow it to be so now for righteousness sake, to fulfill righteousness. Well, we're not being baptized today to fulfill righteousness because guess what? We're unrighteous. We are all sinners. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23. We're going to talk about candidates for baptism in just a little bit. Does everybody need to get baptized? No. That was a shocker. I saw some of you go, whoa. We'll see why in just a few minutes. But the method of biblical baptism in Scripture was to immerse. Changes to that came after the Bible was completed by more than 100 years, in as many as 150 years exactly. Okay? So what takes place during a biblical baptism? First of all, we symbolically participate in the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus when we're baptized. And that's important when we think about being buried in water or immersed because it's a beautiful semblance of what went through with Jesus. Okay? (coughs) Excuse me. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15... we have for us defined what is called the gospel. The gospel known as the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you have received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. I want to stop there for a minute. Because it's in the gospel. It's through the gospel. It's in obedience to the gospel that we are what? Verse 2? Saved. It is through the gospel, by the gospel, we are saved. Okay? Verse 3 says, For I delivered you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And so baptism, as designed by God, is a participatory event into the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. We stand in the waters of baptism as an alien sinner, separated from God by what? Sin. How many sins does it take to be separated from God? Just one. But we're separated from God. God no longer sees us as safe in His sight. 
We are sinners. When we stand in the waters of baptism, we are dying to ourselves. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Biblical baptism is when someone is aware of their sins and is willing to die to their selfishness, willing to die to their own desires, and willing to do what Christ wants. So once you have died, then you symbolically participate in his burial. You are laid under the water briefly. And I will tell you this, there have been a few people that are kind of a little nervous about going underwater. Anybody nervous about going underwater? Somebody is, you just won't say it. That's okay. I've had numerous people right before they're baptized say, Brother Kevin, don't let me drown. I said, we have not had a fatality yet. But we are buried with him in baptism. Put all the way under the water. Just like we bury a dead body. We bury ourselves just as Jesus was buried. Then Paul says, raised up. As Jesus was resurrected from the tomb, we're raised out of that watery grave of baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. The old has been removed. We have put on Christ. We have been clothed with Christ in baptism. The old man is crucified, dead, and buried, raised to walk in newness of life. It's as if you have never sinned. And it's glorious to know that your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus that he has taken them away. And I want to un emphatically tell you something right now. There is nothing about the qualities of this water in and of themselves, there is nothing about that water that saves you. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that saves you. But we come into contact with the blood of Christ in baptism. I want to say it again. We come into contact with the blood of Christ in baptism. It is sin that separates us from God. It is the blood of Jesus that makes us whole. It's the blood of Jesus that saves us. It's the blood of Jesus that takes sin away. We are not speaking about what some people say is water regeneration. No. It's just simple obedience to the gospel. How do you obey the gospel? If the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection, how do you obey that? Because Paul tells the church of Thessalonica that he is coming again in vengeance against those who have obeyed not God and the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, how do you obey the gospel? Isn't that just the perfect rendition of that? To obey the gospel, which is the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, to obey that is in the waters of baptism. As we participate in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, we're raised to walk in newness of life and the blood of Jesus Christ has taken away all of our sins. And that is fantastic. Number two, we come into contact with the blood of Christ in baptism. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 beginning. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself by Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the, everybody? Blood of the cross. So the blood that Jesus shed, when he shed, literally shed his blood, he was like the lamb led to the slaughter, who like laid on the altar back in Old Testament times. Jesus died for us because he was the only person who never sinned. He became the propitiation or the price paid or the atonement for our sacrifice. The substitute offering for us is Jesus. And it's his blood that forgives us of our sins. It is we contact his blood in our baptism. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So what was it that Jesus gave that provided eternal redemption for us? His blood. Not the blood of bulls and goats that couldn't take away sin, but by his own precious blood. 
Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sacrifices for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, listen to this, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What is it that Christ gives us that cleanses our conscience? What takes away the guilt of sin? The blood. The blood of Christ takes away our sins. And because of that, it clears our conscience. You can have a clean conscience. When you obeyed the gospel, you should have been impacted by the weight of sin being lifted from you. I remember just feeling lighter than air when I obeyed the gospel. Just the heaviness of all the guilt and the shame and all the weight of sin that had taken place. When I understood that God took that away by the blood of Jesus, it is an overwhelming, overwhelming burden lifter. Now let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 3. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive by the Spirit. So, we are made alive by the Spirit. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But when do the elements of the blood of Christ and the Spirit, when do that come together? Guess what? In baptism. By whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine and suffering long-suffering, waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Verse 21 says, there is also an antitype, or a symbol, which also saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is not a bath. It is not because of the elements of water physically wash dirt away from your body, but symbolically the blood of Christ washes us of all of our sins. The cleansing agent is the blood, not the water, but we contact the blood in the water as we obey the gospel. And what happens to our conscience? It's clear. It's clear because of the blood. Paul when speaking about his own conversion in a couple of different places, speaks to the fact that when Ananias, who was sent by God to him when he was Saul of Tarsus, remember he was fasting and praying in Damascus, waiting for someone to be sent to him to tell him what he must do? The only thing that he is told to do is found in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Ananias said, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Did he have guilt? Did he have shame? Did he have remorse for the things that he had done against the church? Absolutely. And how did he get rid of that? With the blood of Jesus Christ. When did that take place? When he submitted to baptism. When the blood of Jesus Christ contacted him as he obeyed the gospel the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Again, purpose of baptism, there's multifaceted purposes, but the thing that's emphasized here in Acts 2.38 is remission of sins. Forgiveness of sins. Removal of sins. If it is in baptism, we contact the blood of Christ. Our sins are washed away by His blood. Symbolically in the waters of baptism as we participate in His death, His burial, His resurrection. We're raised to walk in newness of life. When is the newness of life beginning? When you're coming up out of the water. That's when the newness begins. We'll talk about that more next week. We symbolically come into contact with the blood and we just looked at that again where it cleans our conscience with the blood of Christ. Um, in Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 3, Nicodemus, who was a leader of the Pharisees, of the, of the council, I should say, 
He comes by night to Jesus. He wants to ask him some more questions. We know that Nicodemus, Nicodemus believed in Jesus because at the very end when Jesus died, who came to bury him? Joseph and Marathia and Nicodemus. So Nicodemus comes to ask Jesus some important questions about what he's trying to say to people. Jesus said, Most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, some people look at that passage and say, well, the water is when you're born physically. The Spirit is when you're born spiritually. That has nothing to do with that in context. Everybody's born of water. We're talking about birth, the breaking of the water when the baby is born. But that has nothing to do with you entering the kingdom of heaven. That's you entering the world of life. But in order to go to the kingdom of heaven, he says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, what do you mean be born again? How can I enter again into my mother's womb? And he said, unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, how can you do that? Baptism. When we are buried with our Lord in baptism, raised to walk in His life, guess what else? What did Peter just say in Acts 2 and verse 38? Be baptized for mission, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is unto you, to your children, to them that are far off, even to as many as the Lord our God shall call. And that includes who? All of us. So, to be born of water and the Spirit, those elements are found in biblical baptism. We are buried with Christ in water, symbolic of our death, burial, and resurrection with Him, raised to walk in newness of life, and we're given the Spirit when we are baptized. That's water and Spirit coming together, and in so doing, we are automatically added by the Lord to His church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Now listen to this. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Nobody votes on you. I, I know in my own family, there are people that have participated in an immersion baptism, but they will say it has nothing to do with your salvation. It's something you do because Jesus did. It's something you do to testify as a witness of your faith that you're a Christian. But those phrases are not found in Scripture. There's no example of that in Scripture. There are people that say, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and I said this prayer. And then later on, I was baptized. It's not found in Scripture. There's not the first example of a sinner's prayer. There is not the first person that's told to say a sinner's prayer. There's not the first person that's told, pray unto your salvation. Not one time. That is something that man has come up with. And I'm not here to cast off on anybody else. As I already told you, I just want to make sure that we have all obeyed the gospel. I just want to make sure that we're all truly saved, not by the words of men. Jesus says, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. I don't want to face Jesus one day because someone I trusted and loved told me to do something, and I did it, but it turned out to be their opinion. It turned out to be a man-made thought, and it is not an obedience to the gospel. Now, is it possible that God is going to save everybody that gets baptized? Absolutely. It's possible. He's God, and I would be thrilled if He would do that. But I want to make sure that what I tell people to do is found in the Word of God. So that we don't have to doubt. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to worry. We don't have to hope it was good enough. We know we've obeyed what the Bible says. That's why He gave it to us. Just do what He says. So He tells Nicodemus to be born again of water and the Spirit. And then we've already quoted from verse 47, which is at the bottom of that screen. That the Lord has this to His church. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not in Bible. And it doesn't matter the fellowship. There isn't anywhere in Scripture where anybody votes on anybody to be in the church. Not one time. When we obey the Gospel, 
when we become saved, when we are Christians, the Lord adds us to his church. Man doesn't have a say about it and no man can kick you out of his church. Now, can somebody walk away from the Lord? Yes. We're studying Revelation. And by the way, we're studying it tonight. Come on back at 5 o'clock. We're going to review. You know, last week we're at the pig roast. We're going to review and catch you up to speed. So if you've missed a few lessons, we're going to review tonight and we're going to continue on. But there are names blotted out of the book of life. It's because people chose to walk away from the Lord. That's another lesson for another time. Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, the King James says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly also we will be in the likeness of his resurrection. Who then is biblically prepared for and should be baptized? Number one, a sinner who is separated by God because of sin. They are lost and separated from God. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 gives us God's viewpoint of our individual relationship with Him. Listen to this. The soul that sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteous of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. In other words, is God going to judge me based on what my daddy did? My mother? My grandparents? Anybody else? I will stand before God on the merits of what I have done. I am a sinner when I have committed sin. Therefore, there is no example, there is no command of any baby, any infant, any small child being baptized in the Bible. And there's a reason for that. They're not with sin. They have no sin. They're innocent. There's nothing more innocent than a baby. Matthew 18, verse 2. Then Jesus called a little child to them and sat him in the midst of them. And he said, Surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. If we carried the sin of Adam, if you and I were sinners simply by being born, Jesus could not say this statement. He took a small child and said it right there in front of everybody. And he said, unless you repent, unless you change and become as this little child, listen to this, you can by no means enter the kingdom of heaven of heaven. So a child, a small child, there's anything any more innocent than a small child. A child is not bearing the sin of Adam. A child is not bearing the sin of their parents. There is no need to immerse a child. There is no need to uh, pour water on a child. There's no need to sprinkle a child because if a child dies in their infancy, they're in heaven. They're without sin. We commit sin when we know what is right and fail to do it, or when we know something is wrong and we do it, it separates us from God. So we have to have the intellectual assent to sin. Does everybody need to be baptized? No. Babies and small children do not need to be. They're innocent. God takes care of them if they die. <clears throat> now I want to say this. Whew. Talking too fast. I want to say this. I'm not judging anybody's intentions or motivations. For you see, infant baptism came in just recently in, the, in human history, in the history of the church, because of infant mortality. Many, many babies died in their infancy long ago. And parents, don't you love your children? Don't you want to make sure they're taken care of? And wouldn't you certainly want to make sure that they were saved? Well, there became this feeling from what we call Calvinism in Protestant denominationalism that we're all born in sin, that we have the sin of Adam. 
and that they thought, if my baby dies, I want to make sure they're going to go to heaven and they're safe. So they baptized them because they thought they were sinful at birth. But it wasn't necessary because they didn't have the intellectual capacity to believe and repent, which are essential elements of biblical baptism. I've talked fast and I still don't have enough time. So let's cut to the chase. Let me get to the end of this lesson. Why is biblical baptism important? Number one, is our sins that separate us from God and it is sin that separates us from God. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that takes away our sins. Not regeneration in water. There's nothing in the water that does it. The blood of Jesus is cleansing sins, but we contact His blood and receive His Spirit when we are baptized. We are born of water and the Spirit in baptism biblically. We come into contact with the blood of Christ when we are baptized. It's what cleanses us of sin. And when we are baptized, we receive the Holy Spirit. So our time is up. It's way up. But that's okay. Because I, I believe this. There isn't anything any more important than you're going to do today than what we just did. Because this is God stuff. This is God business. And there isn't anything I have to do that's any more important to me today than to make sure that everybody understands what the Bible says about baptism in order to prepare, prepare all of us to leave this world one day and to stand before Him. It is the Lord that commands us to be baptized. There will be people that we'll talk about next week, some in my own family, that will say, baptism is not required, has anything to do with your salvation. We'll address that next week. And, and I thank you so much. You've been so attentive. Um, I didn't see anybody that, that, uh, that I think I lost mentally today. Thank you for staying with me today. Thank you for listening so attentively. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to meet with you privately and we can talk about these things. If you have any concerns about your baptism or the need for baptism, we'll be glad to talk about it from God's Word. If you're a person that today, you've had doubts and concerns about it, let me just tell you something. You can biblically obey the Lord in baptism today and not have to worry about it anymore. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the Word of God. Do you understand the Gospel? That you're a sinner? That Christ died on your, in, your, in your place, on your behalf? Are you willing to repent of your sins as Peter talked about? Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you will all perish. Repentance simply means I'm going to turn my life of sin away from doing what I want to do, from doing what the world wants me to do, from what Satan wants me to do, from what I'm tempted to do that's wrong. I'm going to turn to Christ. I'm going to turn to the Lord and live my life for Him. Are you willing to confess your faith in Him? Jesus said, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Ethiopian eunuch is riding along in the chariot with Philip. They see this water. It's so cool that when he was reading from Isaiah the prophet in verse 35, they began that same scripture, verse 36, and preached them to Jesus. And when they came on their way, they saw this water. And the eunuch said, Well, there's water right over there. Is there any reason why I couldn't go ahead and get baptized right now? And he said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and Philip baptized him. When they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, took him away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Why did he rejoice? All of his sins had been removed by the blood of the Lamb. He was right with the God he went to worship in Jerusalem. He was made right through Jesus Christ and His blood. Do you need to contact that blood today? If you've been thinking about it, been wanting to do it, hey, you just had a, a lesson about it straight from God's Word. Why don't you obey it today? Women change over here. The men change over there. There are robes to step into and pull on. You didn't have to bring anything with you. We got towels. In a matter of a couple minutes, you can step into this water and participate in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Dying to your own sins, being raised to walk in newness of life. And you can know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You can know that the Lord has added you to His church. You can know that His blood has washed you free of all of your sins. And the Lord Himself adds you to His church. One of the greatest things that's ever happened in my life is when I came to truly understand what all that meant. If you need the merits of His blood today, won't you come? As together we stand and sing.
If you did not pick up a communion kit this morning, if you would raise your hand and what would be brought to you. We take time each week in the service to gather around the Lord's table. We gather around to remember. We remember how Jesus came to this earth and lived as a man, how he left heaven, how he showed us what the Father was like. He showed us a better way to live. And then he willingly gave his life for us on the cross. We should take time to remember for all that he's done for us. But in Luke's gospel, when he tells of the institution of the Lord's Supper, in chapter 22, verse 19, he says, Do this in remembrance of me. What do you think he meant when he said, do? Of course, he was talking about the Lord's Supper that had just been instituted. But I think Jesus is talking about something a little deeper than this when he says, do. The word do is an action. He was speaking to the twelve and others who had been with him every day and, and followed him and saw what he did for other people. They were followers of Christ. But isn't that what we are? Isn't that what Christians mean? Aren't we professing to be Christians? Then so we need to be doing. When it tells them do, it has a greater meaning than just a brief moment each Lord's Day morning. It's something that we should do all week long. Matthew 25, verse 31 to the end of the chapter, we have the story of the righteous and the unrighteous, the sheep and the goats. And what did he tell them was done for these people? What was done when he remembered the, the hungry and the thirsty, the stranger and the one needing clothing, the sick and the prisoner? He told them, when you do it, for the least of these, you do it for me. This is what he's calling us to do. Not just a brief moment once a week, but this causes us to do for others all during the week. He expects us to do, and he deserves it. There's a song that I'm going to put up on the screen. I hope some of you know it, but if you don't know it, or if you don't read music, just read along with the words. In remembrance of me, eat this bread. In remembrance of me, drink this wine. In remembrance of me, pray for the time when God's own will is done. In remembrance of me, heal the sick. In remembrance of me, feed the poor. In remembrance of me, open the door and let your brother in. Let him in. Take, eat, and be comforted. Drink and remember too that this is my body and precious blood shed for you, shed for you. In remembrance of me, search for truth. In remembrance of me, always love. In remembrance of me, don't look above, but in your heart, look in your heart for God. Do this in remembrance of me. Almighty God, we, we do remember what was done for us. 
We remember the, the body that carried our sins to the cross. We remember the, the beatings and the scourging, the nails that pierced that body. But he stood firm because he loved us and he loved you. Just thank you for this time that we have together to remember and help this bread that we partake of to strengthen us to remember not only right now, but to do in remembrance of him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Father, again we come before your throne remembering what Jesus did for us. How he shed his blood, the precious blood that was shed for us so that we could be forgiven of sins. That precious blood that if we're walking with him each day continually cleanses us from our sins. Thank you God for your plan. Thank you Jesus that you were willing to shed that blood to give your all for us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. And now, not a part of the Lord's Supper, but uh, for convenience sake, we remember what he did and we remember that all that we have is not ours, but it's his. And so we take this time as an opportunity to give back so that this church can carry on the, the do that he wants us to do. That we need to remember also that each individually, the monies and the things that we're given are given for us to do for others. You will let's pray. Thank you, Father, for all that you've made. Everything is, is yours. Everything we have you made and you allow us to live in and you allow us to, to do. And we just pray, God, that as we have these things, we don't look at it as ours, but things that we can do for others. Forgive us when we're, when we're stingy because you love a cheerful giver. Help this church, these elders, to do with this money that you would have them to do, and each of us every day to do for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It has been a blessing to worship God here at Summer. Amen. Amen. I hope you all stick around after our closing prayer. We have classes for all ages. I hope each of you will find your way back here tonight at 5 as Kevin continues his revelation study. And then we have classes for all of our students as well. So I hope you guys come back tonight at 5. But before Mr. Don Steve comes and lead us in our closing prayer, we're going to sing Come Ye That Love the Lord. And we'll be saying this song. Come ye that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And buzzers around the closer grass around the throne. We're marching on to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion. Yeah.
occurred to me this morning while I was sitting in my chair shivering, <laughs> why we keep this auditorium so cold is that when Kevin brings one like he did today, he gets on fire, we got to keep him cooler. He's going to burn plumb up. <laughs> so, Kevin, you keep bringing it. I'm going to put on another coat. Uh, Miss Print in the bulletin, it says that our Sunday evening service is at 4. It's at 5. I think that's a carryover from last week at the, at the farm. But know that uh, our service is here at the building this evening at 5 p.m. If you would, pray with me. And Father, thank you for the message that we've had today. The truth and simplicity of your word as it's presented so eloquently by Kevin. Let us all take it to heart and use it in our daily lives. Lord, we're so blessed to be able to come this morning in this building and feel safe. Not only from safe from persecution, but safe because we're surrounded by believers, people that care for us, people that love us, people that show us up in our times of need. Lord, we can just feel the love and the warmth around us like a hug. But Lord, we're fixing to go out into the world here in a few minutes. Please let us know that we need your protection. We need your wisdom. We need your strength. We need your love. Because if we try to go out in the world on our own, it's going to end up being a train wreck. But we know, Lord, that we can lean on each other in this church we can lean on you guide guard and direct us and keep us safe till we come back again your name we pray amen